All right, so looks good. People are picking me up. Okay, so today we're gonna finish up the history of astronomy section here. Um, and again, almost everything that I'm talking about it comes from chapter three, except for the very last person that we're gonna talk about, but I'll point that out when we get to it. Um, and up until this point uh, in the history, for a long, long time, for hundreds of years, hundreds of years, hundreds of years, people thought that the Earth was at the center of the solar system. And then Copernicus came along. Not This, this isn't Copernicus, but we saw him last time. Copernicus uh, brought back, well, he came up with the heliocentric model. Not necessarily the very first person ever to come up with it, but he was the one who brought it into the Renaissance, right? Uh, and he had the sun in the center and all of the planets orbiting the sun in perfect circles, okay? Now, uh, after that, after he published that, people were not super thrilled about it, so they uh, tried to do a lot of work to try to prove him wrong. And remember, uh, the last person that we talked about was this guy right here, Kepler, okay? And that's who we're going to talk about first today, because he took the best star charts that existed at the time, and he helped to make them. Uh, and he showed that they really matched up a lot more closely with Copernicus than the old, wrong, Earth-centered idea. So the solar system is heliocentric, not geocentric. But, just like the ancient Greeks saw, whenever you make better star charts, you might find that the idea is not perfect and has to be tweaked a little bit. So it turns out that what Copernicus said was mostly right, but it wasn't perfectly right, okay? And so what Kepler did is he realized he could explain exactly how orbits work using only three laws, all right? And so that's what we're going to be talking about right here. We're going to talk about Kepler's three laws of orbits, okay? Kepler's three laws of orbits. Now, in your book, these are probably called uh, Kepler's three laws of, of planetary motion. But it turns out Kepler didn't know this, but these laws work for all orbits. So they work for the moon around the, uh, around the Earth. They work for... Uh, satellites around the Earth. If I took your body and threw you into space, you'd orbit around the Earth using these same laws. Okay, so real quick, let me get this going. Let's talk about these laws. So, Kepler's first law. Oops, it's coming. There we go. No, there we go. Okay, there we go. Kepler's first law. And with these laws... When, I, when we have them stated here, don't worry if they don't make a lot of sense just from reading them. Um, we'll make them make sense. So Kepler's three laws of orbits, okay? First law, the orbit of each planet around the sun is an ellipse with the sun at one focus, okay? The orbit of each planet around the sun is an ellipse with the sun at one focus focus. Okay, so let's work through this and figure out what everything's trying to say. Okay, so check this out. What is he changing? First up, does anybody know what an ellipse is? Do you guys know what this is? Does anybody know what an ellipse is? It's, uh, it's a kind of shape. What is it? What basic kind of shape is an ellipse? It's an easier, less fancy word for it. Yeah, it's an oval. It's an oval, right? So one thing that Kepler is changing here is the shape of the orbit. Remember, what shape did Copernicus say these orbits were? Perfect circles. And Kepler is saying, no, it turns out the data says it's almost a circle, but it's actually a little bit stretched out. It's more shaped like an oval, okay? Um, and I'll explain a little bit more about what that is right now, actually. Okay, so um, can any of you people out there, can any of you guys uh, draw a perfect circle just freehand? Can any of you draw just a perfect free, like if I asked you like right now to save your life, you need to draw a perfect circle. 
How many of you would survive that situation? <laughs> not, not that many of you, right? I would die too, right? I mean, you saw my circles uh, right here. That's my circles, right? That's the best that I can do freehand. Um, but um, I could save all of our lives if I gave each one of you a thumbtack and a piece of string, okay? If you, if you had a thumbtack and a piece of string, every one of us could draw a perfect circle, okay? Now, how do you do that? Uh, you might have done this in school at some point. If you put the thumbtack in the paper and tie the string to the thumbtack and your pencil and pull it tight, you could just swing it around and you draw a circle, right? Now, in that case, if you drew a circle like that by swinging it around a thumbtack, by swinging your pencil around a thumbtack, don't overthink this. Where would the thumbtack be in the circle? Where exactly would the thumbtack be inside of that circle? Yeah, it would be exactly at the center, right? So this is what I'm getting at right here. If you put a thumbtack in your page, tie it to your pencil, pull it tight, whoop, you're going to uh, draw a perfect circle there. And so that is how Copernicus thought the, the orbits of the planets worked with the sun right here at the thumbtack and then like your pencils kind of like a planet orbiting around the thumbtack. Um, and by the way, this right here, this distance from the center to the edge, that's called a radius. You probably learned about that in school at some point. Keep that in mind. Let's move on to, a, to an ellipse. Now, if you want to draw a perfect ellipse, it's going to be very similar to drawing a perfect circle. The only difference is, instead of having one thumbtack, you're going to have two thumbtacks, okay? Two thumbtacks. So let's say, instead of putting a thumbtack here, you put one thumbtack here and one thumbtack here. So there's got two thumbtacks, okay? And instead of just tying your pencil to one of them, you tie your pencil in a triangle around both of them. Okay, so like your pencils tied around your two thumbtacks, making a triangle of string. Now, if you pulled that tight and drew a shape around both thumbtacks, because the two thumbtacks are spread out, they're going to stretch your shape out. So instead of drawing a perfect circle, instead, you're going to end up drawing an oval, right? So instead of this, you're going to get this. Don't worry about all the words all over it for right now. But yeah, so instead of, again, instead of this with one thumbtack, with two thumbtacks, you're going to get an ellipse, okay? So Kepler is saying that the shape of the orbits are actually stretched out a little bit like this. So the orbits are not perfect circles. He's changed the shape, all right? And now these thumbtacks, they're not at the center anymore. They're not at the center. They're off to the sides at two places that, they're, that are each called a focus, okay? So these two places right here, here and here, to either side of the center inside of the, uh, of the oval, are each called a focus. And the reason I'm pointing that out is that if we go back to the, uh, the first law, Kepler's saying that the sun is at one focus. So, according to Kepler, is the sun perfectly at the center of the orbits of the planets? Is the sun perfectly at the center of the Earth's orbit? Yes or no? According to Kepler here. No. So, Basically, the planets are orbiting the sun, but because the orbits of the planets are a little bit stretched out, the sun is not perfectly at the center. And that's what Kepler's law is saying right here. Oh, and by the way, I should say, uh, Kepler's laws are correct, okay? So we finally, at this point, we're getting to stuff that we still use when we put astronauts into orbits. We use Kepler's laws 
to make sure they stay alive, okay? So this is true. The sun is not perfectly at the center, okay? So right here, if the sun is right there, let's say it's at this focus, imagine the sun's right there, a planet would sweep around this orbit, okay? Now, check this out, check this out. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, with that in mind, does a planet always stay the exact same distance away from the sun? Okay, does a planet always keep the exact same distance away from the sun? No. So some points during the year, we're closer to the sun, and some points during the year, we're further away from the sun. By the way, the law didn't say anything about the other focus. So it turns out that there's nothing at the other focus, okay? So the sun is at one focus and there's nothing at the other one. So the planet will be closer to the, to the sun sometimes and farther away at other times, okay? Um, now, uh, there's a couple of other little things I need to mention here before we move on to law number two. Um, there's one important term in this picture other than focus, and that is this distance right here. It's called the semi-major axis, okay? It's called the semi-major axis. Uh, and that distance is this distance right here, okay? It starts at the center, goes through one focus, and then goes all the way to the edge of the ellipse. So this is the semi-major axis right here from the center through one of the focuses to the edge, okay? Um, why is that particular distance important? Um, it turns out, just like you guys said, uh, since the planet doesn't always have to, or doesn't always stay the exact same distance from the sun, sometimes it's small and sometimes it's large, uh, in order to talk about the size of an orbit, we usually just say the average distance between a, a planet and the sun, okay? Because sometimes it's small, sometimes it's large, but the average would be somewhere in between. It turns out with the way that ellipses work, the semi-major axis right here, so this distance right there, is mathematically exactly the, the average distance for that planet. So if you took all of the possible distances a planet could have and averaged them up, the semi-major axis is the average distance that a planet is away from the sun, okay? And because that's so important, again, if we want to talk about how big an orbit is, we just say how big the semi-major axis is, okay? Um, and uh, by the way, it's important enough that it's represented with just a lowercase a. So anytime you see just a lowercase a, that's a semi-major axis. Okay, now, all right. A um, couple more things I need to say. Are all ellipses, are all ovals, are all ellipses this exact shape? No, okay? All, all ellipses are not this exact shape, okay? Um, some are more stretched out and some are more circular, right? So let me just show you a picture of a few of them right here. Here we go. Here's three ellipses. One, two, three. And you can see as you go down the page, you get more stretched out. If you want to talk about how stretched out an orbit is, you mention its eccentricity, okay? Right there. And the eccentricity is how stretched out an orbit is, okay? So if you want to say how big an orbit is, you talk about its semi-major axis, or average distance from the sun, but if you want to talk about how stretched out that orbit is, it's the eccentricity. The higher the eccentricity, the more stretched out the orbit is, okay? And check this out, check this out, here we go. Um, eccentricity is always a number between zero and one. So a number closer to zero looks closer to this shape, and a number closer to one would be even more stretched out than this, okay? So here's my first question. 
What do you notice about this ellipse? What do you notice about this ellipse with eccentricity zero? What's going on with this guy? What What is this right here? What's that guy? Woo. Yeah, that's a circle, okay? So that circle right there is an ellipse, all right? A perfect circle is an ellipse. Um, it's just a special case. It's the least stretched ellipse. So that means Copernicus wasn't way off. He just had the wrong eccentricity, okay? Um, so where are the foci on this circle? Where are the foci? Where are the focuses? Technically, you're not supposed to say focuses. Two focuses are called foci when you talk about them together. That's the plural. But where are the foci for this thing? They're in the middle. There's two of them, but they're on top of each other. That's why it looks like there's one. So if you see here, as the circle gets more stretched out, as the ellipse gets more stretched out, the foci go farther and farther apart. So the more stretched out your orbit is, the further away from the center of the orbit the sun is, okay? So here's the last thing about law number one. Um, if we look here, Copernicus thought it was this. Kepler's saying it's actually a, a, not a perfect circle. Are the orbits of the planets in our solar system closer to an eccentricity of zero or closer to an eccentricity of one? So are we more shaped close? It, we are an ellipse, so we're not perfectly this, but are we close to this or are we close to one? Yeah, keep in mind, remember, when, when Copernicus looked at the data, he mistakenly thought the orbits were this. So if the orbits were actually super stretched out like this, nobody would look at an orbit like this and think they were seeing a circle, right? So it turns out that uh, in order to mistake it as a circle, the eccentricity must be pretty close to zero, okay? So sometimes orbits are drawn really stretched out like this, but they're actually so close to being a perfect circle with an eccentricity so close to zero that you would probably think they were circles. That's why you can get away with drawing them as circles and um, and nobody really bats an eye at it. Okay, So the eccentricity of the planets is close to this. There are things in our solar system with orbits really stretched out like this. Okay, um, But our planet definitely isn't like that. Um, a thing that would have an orbit like, does anybody know what kind of things have orbits really stretched out like this? Uh, probably not. It's comets. Comets have orbits that are super stretched out like this. And that's actually what makes comets look the way they do. We'll talk more about that later. Um, now, check this out. Okay, so that's law number one. What did Kepler change in law number one? He changed the orbits from circles to ellipses. And he changed the location of the sun from the center to a focus, a little bit off to the side. Boom, all right, law number two. Oh, actually, before we move on to law number two, there is one last thing I wanna say, okay? Uh, here's a picture of, an, of a planet going around the sun. There's special names for the place on the orbit that's absolutely the closest place on the orbit and the place on the orbit that's absolutely farthest from the sun as well, okay? So right here, perihelion is what we call the absolute closest place on the orbit, okay? Perihelion is the closest place on the orbit to the sun, and aphelion, not aphelion, but aphelion, uh, is the place farthest from the sun. Um, so does anybody remember what, what, what does helion probably mean? What does helio right here mean? What's helio? What's that stand for right there? It's the sun, that's right. Helio stands for the sun. So in this case, aphelion just means far from the sun. 
and perihelion just means close to the sun, okay? 